Welcome to Instruction Discussion, our weekly look at the latest topics and trends in education affecting schools here on Long Island and schools around the world. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or student, listen for tips and strategies to help you navigate the educational landscape. There's a bell. It's time to start today's instruction discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello, I'm Kevin Boston Hill, and welcome to Instruction Discussion, where each week we will examine a recent trend or development in education and its impact on Long Island. As we continue to adjust to the world the pandemic has presented us, many people are heading to the beach for some semblance of normalcy. However, when they get there, they see that the beach does not look the same as they remembered. There may be less wildlife, the water doesn't look as clear, and there may certainly be actually less beach to relax on. These disappearing beaches are not the effect of the pandemic, but rather a longer lasting plague, climate change. In her book, The Atlas of Disappearing Places, Our Coasts and Oceans in the Climate Crisis, sustainability expert Marina Pissarro's explores several locations around the world to examine the impact global warming has had on the local environment and what it means for the world. Let's welcome sustainability expert and author Marina Pissarros to Instruction Discussion on 90.3 WHPC. Good morning, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this discussion. We are really excited to have you here and the your book. And I know you had a co-author in the book as well, uh, Christina Conklin. And unfortunately, she couldn't be here with us today as well. But the book really does, from my reading, really hits home for a lot of our listeners, um, again, around the world, literally, who are going to find something, uh, have a takeaway from the book. But before we get into the book itself, let's find out a little bit more about you. So what got you to, uh, what prompted you to actually pursue this particular undertaking? Sure. So um, I had been working for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So it's a federal agency, federal science agency. I've been working there and um, my position was looking at how, um, the, how, to, how to get the science that was uh, coming from a lot of the agencies like USGS, um, NOAA, NASA, and others, how to get the information they were finding about climate change out into the hands of local communities, so cities and towns all across the U.S. And so when I started this position, I thought, all right, <clears throat> We need to start with the, the directors, right? So the director level heads of city departments. So we spent about a year um, doing technical assistance programs, workshops, trainings, really getting them solid on how climate change would impact that community. And after a year um, of this work, they basically said, that's great. This is incredibly important, but you know what? I'm not the decision maker here. You've got to talk to my staff because they're the ones who are writing all the city plans. So we said, okay. So we did the same thing again, a year of you know workshops and, and technical assistance. And then after that year, the staff level, so city planners and building inspectors and engineers said, you know what, this is super important. You're right, we wrote the plans, but we're not actually the decision maker here. It's the elected officials because they're the ones who vote whether or not these plans get approved. So we said, okay. So we went out next, elected officials, got them all on board, which is a hard thing to do. Um, but, you know, uh, local electeds are actually really wonderful in that they usually come from the community. They care a lot about that community. So after that year, sure enough, they said, this is really important. We want to do this. But you know what? I am not the decision maker here. You got to talk to my constituents because I just do whatever they tell me to do. And so, you know, through that process, so then I was back with the public and the public was the ones who was asking the science agencies, give us the science, what is going on? And so, you know, to me, it was it was an interesting process in five years of my life, looking at how each part of the system felt like they maybe didn't have the authority or the ability to actually take action on climate change, whereas every single node of that had a set of responsibilities. So, I started thinking about that general public, right? The public that the electeds wanted me to talk to, who I'd already been working with and thought, well, one thing is the science is so incomprehensible to the average person. And we don't normally think in terms of like, um, you know, 
uh, curves of disasters and unpredictability and all the language of science, what we think about is the places and the people and the animals and the experiences that we love, which we're losing. So we decided to take that approach, tell the story of these places, do it in a way that's beautiful, full of lots of maps and imagery, and that's more accessible. So the book is really grounded in science, but that is not the entire focus of the book. So and I know you're going to... Oh. No, that's okay. And, and I noticed that one of the, the cities, because I think you profiled about 20 cities around the world in the, in the book. And one of those cities that you profiled, of course, is New York City in the surrounding areas here, um, especially right after Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So I was wondering, what can you share with our listeners? I'm sure they probably already know firsthand what the impact of the hurricane was. But what can you share with them as far as what was the data that you discovered and what were some of the lessons that were learned as a result? So I had, we did amazing interviews uh, in New York. There are so many people who are working on climate change. Um, and I think that, you know, Sandy really brought that home in a way that uh, a lot of people weren't thinking about, like the immediacy of disasters. So sea level rise is something that will, it's happening in New York and Florida and San Francisco. It's happening all over the place. And um, scientists often refer to that as the slow moving emergency because, you know, the seas are literally creeping up slowly. But then we have these fast emergencies, which are getting harder and faster and more frequent. And that's the hurricanes, the floods, the extreme weather, both ends, right? Heat, drought, water, all of it. Um, and so we did some amazing research with a lot of leaders in New York, actually, on what's being done, what those lessons have learned, uh, what those lessons are that have been learned and, and where we go from here. And New York is a place that's thinking about all three areas that are important for um, thinking through climate change. So it's... Um, referred to as just allow me to geek out for a moment here, um, climate change adaptation, mitigation, and managed retreat. And each of these are three very different ways of looking at climate change. So adaptation says uh, problems are going to happen. We need to figure out what we do about it, right? And so that can be putting houses on stilts or um, moving freeways away from the edge of the water or making floodable infrastructure. Um, Mitigation says, okay, but we need to minimize the negative impacts that we're going to have. And that's where people may think about um, the infrastructure plan that Biden has going right now or things like clean energy. If anyone's heard clean energy transition, these are mitigation strategies, right? We want to limit the amount of fossil fuels that are going into the air. We want to keep as much fossil fuel in the ground as possible to limit the problems. Um, and then we have managed retreat. And that's basically saying that the taxpayers should not be responsible for paying to rebuild in areas where there has been destruction. This one has been a weird one because um, a lot of people, when, when the term was first introduced in California, where I am, a lot of people really bristled at the idea of retreating. They were like, no, we need to fight it. Which I get, you know, my family is all in the service, so I totally understand wanting to like stand up and fight something, but you can't really fight the sea. I think we've seen that from Homer through the ages, right? And so, um, so trying to wrap our heads around what managed retreat means is really tricky. And especially somewhere like New York, where property values are high, people are in a community that's, you know, that's where your ties are, right? That's your friends and your family home and your loved ones. And so how do you even consider managed retreat moving away from that place you knew? Um, what's happened is, and so that in New York is the same story in Louisiana and Houston and a lot of areas, right? And um, we have policies in place that, you know, FEMA will help you rebuild, um, which is great because when you're devastated, um, I, I actually have experience with this in California in a different context, flooding. Um, FEMA has been there to help. But what winds up happening is that taxpayers are the ones who are paying to rebuild in those areas. And so FEMA is looking at not rebuilding in floodplains or not at least not insuring it and not you know providing money to do it. So it's a very managed retreat is a really tricky conversation, but it's something that we have to start looking at harder and harder and, and really wrapping our heads around. Um, 
if you will allow me, I know I've been talking for a really long time, but if no, you'll that's allow quite me. all right. That's okay. quite all right. I know that you have some really, really valuable in information to provide us. So I'm going to go ahead and let you continue. But as you do, I also want you to think about um, just kind of elaborating on because I know one of the things that I've noticed, at least taking my family down to the beaches, that the beaches have been disappearing. And I was wondering if um, what impact you and I think you just tried to discuss that a little bit. But if you can go a little bit more into that as well um, as you continue with your responses. So impacts to beaches, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, beaches are also a huge economic engine in a lot of areas. So, you know, New Jersey and New York and um, all along, actually all along the East Coast, there is a huge amount of money that's uh, generated by beach adjacent tourism and on beach tourism. Um, and so as those beaches become smaller and smaller due to rising seas, right, every year it's a couple of inches, there is literally less and less place for people to go. Um, I think that in areas that are natural on the other side of that beach, so if you think about the waters coming up this, uh, you know, the waters coming up the shore, there's a strip of beach, and then what's on the other side of that strip is really important. If it's a sand dune on the other side of that strip, then the beach may itself be able to retreat, right? Then the beach is moving back towards the natural area into the dunes, and there's a way to preserve a larger area for people to, you know, swim and play and have a happy Saturday afternoon at the beach. Um, if what's on the other side of that is a freeway, then there's a hard stop. There's nothing you can do to expand that beach. You're just going to have a tiny beach and then you're done. Um, now, when I, I mentioned the ideas of adaptation and mitigation and managed retreat, so one a strategy for adapting would be to actually move that freeway, right? Move it back further away from the beach so that the beach is allowed to go. You can't really do that with houses, or at least it's not as easy to do that with houses. Um, that's a huge issue all around the world, actually, is what to do with often very expensive coastal property that's right on a beach or that's right on a cliff edge. So beaches are one thing that's getting smaller. Cliffs are eroding. There were a couple of really high profile cases in Sydney, Australia, where, you know, beautiful mansions were tipping into the sea. And something that I think we will see more and more frequently, and it's one of the hardest things for me to have researched. There's a lot that we can do, and there's a lot that we can fix and plan for. And then there are some things that we simply are losing. And the story actually, um, the New Press, uh, which is the publisher, had come to me talking about exactly this. The editor, uh, Jed Bickman, uh, lives in New York and has a young son. And he, he said to me, um, you know, Marina, I know you're a, you're a climate change planner. And so when I think about this issue, I do think about like, what, where will I go with my son? Like, what are those childhood experiences that I had that I, that my kid is not going to grow up with or that I won't be able to share with them or they won't pass on. And I think that there is a part of climate change that we just need to grieve. There will be things that we lose and we cannot have them. And I think some people get really depressed and deflated about that fact. It is terrible. Um, but there's another way to deal with that, which is to grieve that loss and then figure out what there is left to save and go save it. Now, you also you mentioned in the book that we need to just kind of going off of what you just mentioned here, as far as the grieving period, you mentioned somewhere in the book that you that we should become um, a little frightened, a little bit scared and a little bit hopeful at the same time. So can you explain that that thought? Yeah, I think um, we should be afraid because it is not just um, beaches that we're losing, which is it is wonderful. And I, you know, it's also a part of my experience. It's also food security for the one billion people who rely on seafood as their, you know, their source of protein. So um, a lot of that is in developing nations. So in the U.S., you know, most Americans are not absolutely dependent on the seafood they catch for the protein in their diet. But that's the that's the same kind of issue that we're dealing with. That is very scary when you think about the loss of food security, the loss of home security, right, through um, disasters that are happening more frequently. <clears throat> but 
it can't get to a point where you then turn away um, and just throw up your hands. Um, there are things that we can do um, and there is hope that we can have. I think about it, <laughs> this is, might be a bit of a strange analogy, but I think about um, planning for college for my kids. So my kids are pretty young and to me, college sounds like a disaster, right? Like it's going to be so expensive and I don't make enough money to pay for that, right? But I, can, I can't just turn away and say, well, I guess they can't go to college, right? What I do is I save. And so every month I put away a little bit for them because I know that that gives me more options when they're 17 years old, right? If I were to just turn away and say, uh-uh, I can't, I don't have enough money. I can't do this right now. I'll figure it out then they're gonna have almost no options when they're 17, right? And I think about climate change planning a little bit like that. We have to start saving for our future now. And it, that doing that gives us more options. Like um, the, the, most of the infrastructure that you see out there, the houses and um, buildings and seawalls and roads, they have a life expectancy. And so planners, city planners think about that as around 50 years is how long something is supposed to be there. So one of the reasons why Biden's infrastructure plan is so huge is because we have not actually maintained the infrastructure in this country. We haven't turned it over every 50 50 years. We have a lot that's 100 years old, right? Twice as long as it should have been there. So now we have a lot of investing to do. So if I think about um, how we like literally how we do that planning for the future, as something nears the end of its life, as a road needs to be repaired, or as buildings need to come down, or as we decommission a port space, we need to have climate change be one of the very first thoughts about how we, you know, how, how we deal with that area, how we rebuild it, where we put it, you know, how we're going to use it in the future. You are listening to Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and our guest today is sustainability expert and author of the book, The Atlas of Disappearing Places, Our Coast and Oceans in the Climate Crisis, Marina Pissarro's. Now, what I want to talk about a little bit is at the end of each or within each of the profiles, you mentioned or you included this view from 2050. So I know that's 30 years from now, well, 19, uh, 29 years from now. So why did you include that in there? I know it's a, it's a fictitious look at or look back from that time frame, but why did you feel the need to include that? Um, <clears throat> I wanted people to get a sense of how close these changes actually are. I mean, you think 2050, uh, God willing, that's within my lifetime. It's certainly in the lifetimes of my children. And if I think about it in terms of like how to plan, it is basically a week from now, right? It is immediate. We need to start thinking about it now. And so I, I am a huge science fiction fan and I love the way that science fiction allows us to think about alternative futures than the one we're on. It's creative, we can explore new ideas. So for me, bringing a little bit of that creativity into the future and really helping people see what the world could look like was important to me. Um, I also wanted to make sure that the year was close enough that it did feel fairly immediate. And what we did is every single one of those futures is a sort of realistic depiction, right? There are not war robots and there's not, you know, we haven't discovered wormholes and none of that kind of science fiction is in there. It's more just sort of what will this future look like if we keep going this way or what, how, how could we solve this problem with the technology and the science that we have now. It was also important to me that none of these are, we invented some crazy new thing that we've never heard of, right? It's all stuff that's available to us right now, because I think that if we're able to sort of pick up the tools and the knowledge that we have now, we can actually solve a lot of these problems in 2050. So it was actually really fun to do those, to just sit down and think about what the future would be like under certain scenarios and, um, and then think about like, you know, work black, work back from the science and the technology to figure out how we'd get there. It's always very 
interesting and at least i find it very interesting to like you say to explore all the different possible timelines that can be that can branch off and things kind of like uh i don't know if you watch the uh the marvel series loki but you see all the different uh the, the nexus events that happen and all the branches that got, go off and everything so that's what i was thinking about when i saw all the different uh things from 2050 from all the different uh locations that you had explored so i just wanted to see what your thoughts were uh, about that it's the multiverse just like uh just like marvel so the 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 way that we wrote it it is not that all of them tie into a very tidy future um they are you know they're all looking at the same set of general principles um but they they do tell the story of each individual person so it is black widow and loki and um the hulk and all the rest of them and all the rest of it, like you said, it's, it the, it's the multiverse. So let me ask you this one, because and I want you to, to talk about a little bit more about your personal experiences here as well. But how can we incorporate this type of work into our schools? And because I know you talk about you wanted to see this become a uh, part of our art programs and education and, and so forth. And even the book itself, as much of the information in there is very scientifically based, there's a lot of beautiful artwork in the book as well. Um, so I do want to give kudos to uh, to Ms. Conklin on that as well and, and yourself for including that in there. But how can we incorporate this type of book or even any of the work that you're doing into our schools and our communities so that we can continue this work and perhaps even lessen the impact that we foresee in 2050? That's a great question. And it's one I think about a lot. I've worked a lot in um, the public school systems here in California on these issues. A couple of years ago, some colleagues and I developed a, a set of curricular resources that could be used in AP environmental science high school classes, and also sort of like 101 introductory college classes. And what we wanted to do was use the next generation science standards, the NGSS framework, you know, which is really saying um, it's just a way to make science more meaningful to you, right? So you're, you do a, a process that you're looking at, um, uh, you, you gather data, you analyze data, and then you basically tell your story around that data is one of the ways that I think about um, NGSS within science. And so we thought, well, how do we, like, how can we apply that in schools around climate change? And so we developed a curricular resource whereby students went out and collected a couple of different types of data in their communities about um, sea level rise risk and flooding. So some of the data, they, some students chose to do surveys like community surveys, um, and some of them chose to gather photographic evidence of flooding. And so the surveys were super interesting to me because um, they were conducted in the language of the students. So it was in, you know, Cantonese and Tagalog and Vietnamese and all these languages that aren't really spoken by the city planners who are the ones doing the planning. So the students were able to get this data that's so important to the community and it's stuff that wasn't being reported elsewhere like, um, information about mold in housing because of flooding events that had happened and landlords had never remediated that mold, right? So it's like literally a public health concern that was not being gathered anywhere else. So the students collected this data and I was just blown away by what they found and then they analyzed that data. And then, you know, I said, so where do you, you know, for that third piece of NGSS, you know, connecting your data to the real world, to your community, what do you want to do? And they said, we want to go talk to, we want to do test, you know, testify before the board of supervisors about this. And I was so inspired by what these students did and how they were able to raise issues in their community at this decision-making level. Um, it was probably literally my favorite project. And it's also how I wound up, um, how the new press wound up approaching me to write this book is they said, that kind of work is what everyone should be doing, right? Like understanding what the impacts are, connecting it to yourself, and then figuring out how you can actually have an impact. So um, I would love to see more programs like that. And it's that final piece, that connection, which I feel like we're often missing. Um, I have two students uh, who live with me, my children. So um, one sixth grader and one fourth grader, and they've both learned about climate change in school. And 
I'm totally Monday morning quarterbacking on on the curriculum because I see it and they come home and they are so sad because what they learn about, it is like all dead seals and destruction all the time. And they don't have anywhere to go with that grief and anywhere to go with the the what now. And so I actually wind up like spending a lot of time like bringing my kids along on that journey, showing them the things they can do. I think it's great that we have um, climate in schools now, but we have to be able to give people some sort of actions because our youth are really inheriting, they're inheriting a huge amount of problems and just stopping at, here you go, have a whole bunch of dead seals and a million problems. That is not a way to, you know, enter the world as a young person. So what can the average listener therefore do to help mitigate some of this? And what are some of the solutions that you have seen that seem to be uh, quite promising in that front? So I think that there are three, and I talk about this in the book a little bit, in the final section of the Atlas, I talk about the three areas where we have influence as a consumer, a citizen, and a community member. I think most people are most familiar with um, you know, what to do as, as a consumer, right? You can eat less meat. Um, you can do one of the many fun, like swear off plastic challenges, which there's a lot of actually plastic alternatives now. Um, you can buy appliances and a car that are all electric the next time you need them, right? So we're familiar with the consumer part. I'm really interested in the community part and in the citizen part. So community I think of is like, um, I belong to my school's PTA. I belong to the green team at my work. I, you know, belong to, or I can encourage my church to get um, renewable energy, right? So I belong to all these different kinds of communities that all can be doing important things about climate change, not just my own particular actions, right? And I have the ability to influence all those communities. And then at the citizen level, I've been in public service for a long time, and um, I I would really encourage a lot of your listeners in particular to think about a career in public service. It can be be difficult. Uh, It can be frustrating, but it can also be incredibly rewarding because this is where a lot of those policies happen. This is where, you know, change is being made. So um, if you don't want to go into a career in public service, there are shorter term uh, options. For example, um, join your local water board or um, one of the committees in your community. You can also, there's a lot of ways now to contact all of your elected representatives from you know, your supervisor councilmen all the way through your federal elected representatives who all should be working for you and paying attention to what you as a constituent want to see done. Is there a way that we can get act or that schools can get access to that uh, curriculum that you spoke about earlier as far as the and maybe even adapt it down to not just so it's not just using AP classes in high school, but maybe even in regular classes in high school or even in middle school? Absolutely. Yeah, we actually have done some adaptation on that already. I will be publishing that to my website and probably through my Twitter account and LinkedIn as well. So um, if anyone is interested in following up on that, um, I am on Twitter at Marina Psaros. Um, LinkedIn is probably the same. And then uh, my website is marinapsaros.com. Great. Thank you for that information. So it's Marina Pissarros. That's P-S-A-R-O-S for our listeners who are looking to get into that information. And I think I do encourage you all to definitely visit the website and contact Ms. Pizarro's on Twitter. And if you have any other questions, I hope it's okay that I say that uh, contact Ms. Pizarro's on Twitter. If you do have any further questions on anything dealing with the, the book itself or even um, just sustainability around the world, what we can do to help our country or help our world heal so that we have something to pass down to our our future generations. We'd like to thank our guest today, sustainability expert and author of the book, The Atlas of Disappearing Places, Our Coasts and Oceans in the Climate Crisis, Ms. Marina Pizarros. Thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and thank you all for listening to Instruction Discussion right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.